Let's bring Josh Pawnell in. We'll talk birds. Uh, and we'll also uh, take a look at this game and some of the things that uh, Jim Schwartz said today. Also, Frank Reich. Josh, how are you, pal? Good, guys. How are you doing today? Doing well. And uh, obviously, this is a tough matchup. Uh, you look at all the numbers in this particular game, and you look at Minnesota's defense, and uh, they don't do a lot wrong on the defensive side of the ball. There's, like, not one area where you're like, all right, let's attack this spot. They seem pretty sound just about everywhere. They haven't given up more than 17 points in a game the whole season. So let me just start off by asking you, do you look at this game as a mismatch? I mean, absolutely, just because I think almost anybody against this Viking team is a mismatch. I mean, this defense is clearly, I think, the best in the NFL. Um, and no matter who you put them up against, you know, if they're going up against the Patriots, I guess that's not really a mismatch. But when you go up against not just a great team that the Vikings have on the defensive side of the ball, but also just great personnel, um, you really don't find many combinations where you have both the coaching and the players um, at a very high level. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's what the Vikings have. Yeah, and uh, one area that they are really good is getting to the quarterback. They, they you know, they uh, have a lot of pressure. Um, after what you saw last week from Vitae and knowing the struggles this offensive line has had, uh, or I guess I should say had with him in the lineup, uh, this is even a bigger challenge, is it not, than what Washington brought to the table? Yeah, it's absolutely going to be a bigger challenge. I mean, and it's, it's not just a bigger challenge in terms of, uh, the personnel and going up against just, you know, one good pass rusher after the next, but also just in terms of the communication that the Eagles offensive line will have to have on this uh, against this Vikings defense. What they do a lot of is they'll show, you know, six guys coming, and maybe they'll bring all six, maybe they'll drop three, and, you know, maybe they'll bring both linebackers and have a defensive tackle drop back into coverage. So the communication – is really going to be key. And so when you have that rookie right tackle out there, being at home is really going to help him uh, because they're not going to have to worry about silent snap counts uh, and things of that nature. But it's still going to be a huge, not just physical challenge of blocking, but a mental challenge going up against this scheme. Hey, uh, a couple things. Um, today, Jim Schwartz said the reason it looks so bad is because we were bad. Uh, when you look yeah. over what the Eagles defense had trouble with, <laughs> was it everything or was there something specific that Washington was able to key on that Minnesota might pick up on? And that almost, I guess, piggyback to did Detroit do something that Washington found and now Washington, uh, now Minnesota can duplicate? Well, I do think that Washington, uh, they did pick up something from Detroit in terms of those crack tosses where they'll have a receiver or a tight end or just someone split out, come back down the line of scrimmage, uh, you know, have a down block on the team's event, pull the tackle or whichever the offensive lineman is outside and try to get that edge. And that's something that the Eagles struggled with against the Lions in the first half. Uh, Washington had success with that against Philadelphia. Um, but outside of that specific thing, it really was just breakdown. As Jim Schwartz said, not on all three levels, but all four levels, yeah. even at Stevenson coordinator. I mean, you have, especially after Betty Logan uh, exited that game with that groin injury, the defensive line uh, wasn't doing well. The linebackers weren't, weren't staying in their gaps, being disciplined. The safeties, the corners, whatever position group you want to name, did not play well. Uh, for the Eagles defense. And the, really what it comes down to, and multiple guys on the defense said this this week, was that they were just trying to do too much, that they didn't trust each other enough. You know, for whatever reason, um, they were just gonna, you know, trying to make the plays and not just staying disciplined and doing their job. They are trying to do too much. Uh, so that's going to be the big key going forward, not just against Minnesota, but in the following games, just trust the guy next to you, do what you need to do, and don't try to be the hero on every play. That was kind of his message today. Josh Pawnell is us is with us, phillymag.com. Birds 24-7, Eagles and Vikings this weekend uh, on 97.3 ESPN. Um, you know, the one thing with the defense, too, this Eagles defense is, you know, getting to the quarterback, getting pressure. That's something they should be able to do this week, right? Minnesota, if, uh, you know, you look at the Eagles and their problems on uh, with uh, the right tackle spot in the last week, they've been going through this the whole season. They haven't played with either of their starting tackles. Yeah, and that's the thing with the Vikings is the injuries along the offensive line 
And I actually think Eagles fans would be surprised at how many shots Sam Bradford has taken and gotten up every time. I mean, honestly, he's had a lot of throws where you just think, you know, this guy is not going to get up after this, or you know, he, he might he might have a stinger, or something might be wrong with him. But um, th- that toughness is something that he's really shown so far this season. Um, but also, obviously, it's reflective of how easy it can be to get to him. So even though he gets the ball out quickly, he gets the ball out on time and in a rhythm. If you don't get a sack, the Eagles should be able to get several uh, several quarterback hits this week. Um, and that's something that they're really going to have to do to kind of counteract the Vikings defense because it's not hard to imagine a situation where the Eagles defense really has to carry this team to a one this week uh, with the Eagles offensive line having a really tough matchup. And they did have the interception return for the touchdown last week, and they got the special team touchdown. So there were some positives there because that interception return came from some pressure. So it shows, you know, what – they can do when they do get some pressure here on the flip side uh minnesota we kind of touched on gets a lot of pressure what you know looking at vitai's game and i know he's been talked about a lot uh peterson said he's going to stick with them and that he got better as the game go on uh so it's like a debate night here that's fact checked that did he get better as the game go on is that a true statement I mean, he got better as the game went on, but that's not really the highest standard to have. Like, <laughs> you can say he got better as the game went on, but he still didn't play well. I mean, I, I mean that's a true statement, but I would also say it's misleading. I mean, if you think about I mean, the first sack that the Eagles gave up was, was Brent Tuff against Ryan Kerrigan, but, but Carson Wentz's his first two dropbacks, he was sacked both times. So you, there really is nowhere to go but up after that point. So... I mean, I do think Vitae settled in a little bit, um, but he still didn't play well. And, and the thing that surprised me a little bit was it wasn't just pass protection. I mean, we kind of expected him to have at least some troubles against Ryan Kerrigan, especially one-on-one when he wasn't getting some chip help from a running back or a tight end. But he also missed assignments in the run game. I didn't block terribly well uh, on the ground. So that's something that he got better but I don't know why you would have much confidence that he's going to play well this week. Josh Palmer with us as we talk about the Birds and the Vikings matchup and also take a sneak peek back when we think about the All-22 film. Uh, Mike Hill and I both love that so much, Josh, how you break down the All-22 and go back play by play and item by item, so to speak, of what went wrong. And so on the offensive side of things, Zach Ertz was supposed to be a pretty good matchup against the Redskins, and yet that didn't materialize last Sunday. Why do you think that was the case? Yeah, well, I mean, it really was a breakdown on several fronts. I guess the, the most obvious one was just the one up, the one big opportunity he did have. He dropped that potential touchdown pass uh, on that quick slant inside the 10-yard line. So when it comes down, sometimes it's as simple as you need to make those types of plays. But he was still targeted only three times, which is the lowest amount he's had since the beginning of last season. He only caught one pass, which was the lowest amount of catches he's had since 2014. And that was a lot of it had to do with not just the offensive line and really not giving Carson Wentz enough time. But because the offensive line didn't block very well, Carson Wentz couldn't get into a rhythm. And a couple of plays that really looked like he got rid of the ball, especially earlier in the game, quicker than he normally would because he was worried about that pass rush. And then later on, when he did get a little bit better pass protection, um, he was trying to go too much for those home run plays. So, you know, they're down seven points, and his mentality is, well, let's get that get those seven points on this play, whereas it should be, okay, it's second and six. I have Zach Ertz open on an eight, you know, underneath route. He can get eight, nine yards, keep the chains moving. Um, but Carson Wentz wouldn't go that route. So that really is just something that comes with being a rookie. Um, as he's in that situation more and more, he'll recognize that just take what the defense gives you. As long as you're moving the chains, getting those first downs, um, that's what you need to be doing. So part of it was Carson Wentz just not missing Zach Ertz when he was open, but also a big part of it was the offensive line. If they would have given Carson Wentz more time, Zach Ertz could have easily had another 40 to 50 receiving yards. 
And then the flip side of that, or, or maybe in conjunction with that, you talked about the hits that have been on Carson Wentz so far this season. Uh, do you think he's holding on to the ball a little bit too long, and do you expect to see against the Vikings just that zip, quick release, you know, one step back, out? Yeah, and that's the thing is that really manifested late in that Washington game. Those last two sacks Carson once took, they were both on him, uh, particularly uh, the first one in that fourth quarter. But that's something that, as I said before, it, it's a product of being down by seven points late in the game. I want to say there was about three minutes left around there, and his mentality is let me try to get all the points. But also I, I do think you have to give credit to Washington I think they did, they've done the best job in terms of scheming Carson Wentz of anyone this season in terms of mixing up the coverages, uh, making him you know kind of be a little bit confused. Where should I go? Um, he hasn't seen as varied coverages as he did against Washington. But in terms of Minnesota, he absolutely has to get the ball out of his hands quickly because even though a lot of times they'll show six guys and still only bring you know four, maybe even three. They will bring at least one blitzer, two blitzers, uh, a pretty good amount. So the Vikings may have a free rusher on him, but that's one area where, particularly with the blitz, Carson Wentz has been very impressive, not just in terms of pocket movement or escaping the pressure, but just getting the ball out uh, and hitting his hot read. That's something that I've been impressed, particularly with hitting those hot reads <clears throat> excuse me, on those blitzes and recognizing this is where the pressure is coming from. This is where the hole is going to be in the defense. And I'll get out, get the ball out, get a six or seven yard gain. So I'm actually very curious to see how this plays out because the offensive line, I don't think, will do terribly well against this Vikings defensive line and linebackers. But Carson Wentz, through the first five games, has been very impressive, particularly for a rookie against the Blitz. Josh Bonner with us, phillybag.com and Birds 24-7. Well, one of the things that came out of the Redskins game was that uh, Dorio Green-Beckham played the highest percentage of snaps that he played all season. In your eyes and from your view, uh, is Dorio Green-Beckham uh, there? Is he fully established as an Eagles player now, or is he still coming along? Yeah, I mean, he's at this point, he's fully uh, caught up on what he needs to be. He understands the playbook. Um, you know, the Eagles coaches feel comfortable with putting him uh, in pretty much any situation. So you're really going to see only an increasing role for Doriel Green Beckham. And I think that's going to be a, a, an emphasis that you're going to see going forward more so is how can I get this guy the ball in situations where he can get yards after the catch because that's something that, hands down, Doriel Green Beckham has been the best Eagles receiver by far in terms of getting those extra yards particularly his stiff arms, whether it was against Washington um, or against Detroit, his stiff arm has been especially effective. And so when you have a quarterback like a young quarterback like Carson Wentz, you want to help him get into a rhythm by giving him easy throws that still get you chunks of yards. And right now, Doriel Green Beckham uh, has been one of, really the best guy in terms of, okay, we'll give him the ball on a maybe two- or three-yard pass, and he'll break a tackle and get me eight or nine more. So he's definitely going to be a very key guy, really playing probably the second most snaps of the receivers right around whatever Nelson Aguilar gets and obviously just under what Jordan Matthews gets. Yeah, they might need him a little bit more this week. Uh, Matthews, you know, he didn't practice Wednesday. He was back out there today, but uh, who knows if he's at a full strength. But uh, Frank Reich did kind of highlight DGB as a guy that he, you know, it sounded like anyway – that he is ready to implement him more in the offense. I don't know how much say Frank Wright gets in the playing time, but at least it sounded today as if he is ready to kind of unleash the beast if he's got it in him. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to see at this point, you're not going to see really much of a decline of Dorel Green Beckham snaps going forward compared to Washington. If anything, it'll go up some, but he's going to play almost all the snaps uh, on the offensive side of the ball. He's a guy that they really – view as not just a red zone threat, um, but also, as I mentioned before, get him the ball, have him pick up some yards after the catch. And so you're really going to see his role, especially you know, Nelson Aguilar, if he continues to be quiet as he has been the first five games this season. Uh, they're really hoping that Green Beckham can kind of be a spark plug and an X factor for this offense. Hey, uh, let me get your quick opinion on this, Josh. Um, Kelsey with the plantar fasciitis this week. Wisniewski not happy. 
Um, obviously, uh, he thinks, uh, you know, that maybe the coaches are just, uh, you know, he, he kind of made a crass little remark like uh, they're smart, they know what they're doing. Um, he obviously isn't happy, but everybody is insinuating that he's not happy because he's not playing left guard when there's an opportunity uh, to make maybe some movement. But does Wisniewski potentially think he should also be thought of to be the starting center? I mean, I honestly think he just wants to be playing, period. I think if you said, would you rather be the starting center or rather be the starting left guard, he would probably say center because he has significantly more experience at that position. But I think his point is just that right now there's a player on the offensive line, specifically Halapulavati Vaitai, who is not better than me. Why am I not playing? I think that's kind of the mindset that he's taken, which is one that's understandable. Um, if, you, if you don't see – I think part of it is the Eagles want to develop Vitae and see what they have in him in terms of could he be our starting right tackle going forward, you know, after Jason Peters eventually leaves and Lane Johnson moves to the left side. But if you don't see improvement from Vitae in the short term, uh, he should not be playing. They need to right, move well, Alan Barber to right tackle. Yeah, Plug in with yeah, because left like, guard. It, 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 Josh, isn't it like one of those situations where I can understand their thought process? Hey, we drafted this guy. We want to see what his ceiling is. If you're at the end of the road and your team's not making the playoffs and there's three or four games left and you just want to see it, but your team's three and one and you're playing a road division game and it was like they had the mentality of a team that was just kind of playing out the string. That's what really makes me scratch my head. And I, and I keep going you know, back to this thought. He wasn't active for four games, which means even if Lane Johnson got hurt, he wasn't the next man up. Now, I understand, hey, he only plays right tackle, so he's not that swing guy that can play other spots. But my point really there is if Lane Johnson got hurt, they were going to have to move guys around or play somebody else in that situation, yet they weren't willing to do it when the game actually mattered more. And there's where I got to really, you know, uh, take some, uh, you know, take that up with Peterson a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and also, isn't it interesting that one name, I don't think I've ever heard his name pop up in this conversation, is Matt Tobin, who yep. for the first four games of the season was both the backup left tackle and the backup right tackle. So there's this guy that you've had that's been your backup swing tackle for the first four games. My tie comes in. So I, I understand the argument that Tobin is better on the left side compared to the right side. But I'm not sure that even if you want to keep Alan Barber at left guard, if Vitae keeps playing like this, I'm, I don't think you can sell me on the fact that Tobin right now is not better than Vitae at right now. Right. So I exactly. Think and even if you don't like, want to move Barber, even if okay, let's say for instance Wisniewski stinks and you don't like him either. Barber played right tackle when Johnson was suspended the last time. It's not like you're asking this guy to do something that is so foreign. To my understanding, and you would know better than me, he took reps there in training camp when this news came out. So he actually practiced there a little bit. He was a right tackle mainly before he even got here. And Tobin has also played the guard spots before. It just seems that there are so many other scenarios other than the one that they put this poor kid in. Yeah, well, I do think that there's validity to the argument of being hesitant to move Barber because left guard is definitely his best position right now. But the problem is, even if you move him to right tackle and he's not great for you, even if he's solid, I mean, you don't want to have, you don't want to you know, keep him at left guard and insert someone into right tackle who just kind of ruins your game plan and your execution doesn't allow your quarterback to get into a rhythm and make throws down the field. I mean, Carson Wentz only completed, I want to say, four passes that traveled more than 12 yards in the air against Washington. And every time, it's because they use a running back or tight end to chip the defensive end. So you, when you have a guy like that who just disrupts what you want to do, um, you have to make the sacrifice of, okay, I'd rather have two guys that are okay at left guard and right tackle rather than one guy who's awesome at left guard and a guy at right tackle who's just not giving us much of a chance to win. Hey, Josh, I'm listening to you and Mike talk, and uh, the thought emerges to me, do you think that Jason Peters may be pushed to keep Barbary next to him? Um, I, I don't think that that would be a, a very big factor. I think it just comes down to uh, what Jeff Stoutland, the Eagles offensive line coach, and obviously Peterson, and even 
Frank Reich come down to. I don't think it's a matter of Jason Peters, you know, blocking Alan Barber from moving. Um, I think it's just a matter of the Eagles thought that they would get more from Vitae than they have, and they expect him to play better going forward than he has. So a combination of really Vitae not playing as well as they thought he would, um, and then also just they thought that if they moved Barber from left guard to right tackle, there would be a significant drop-off. So I don't think, you know, Peters plays much of a role in this. Uh, Josh Pawnell, Birds 24-7 at phillymag.com, uh, joins us uh, to take a look at this Eagles-Vikings matchup here. Um, if, for you, okay, there's a spot where Philadelphia was the pull-off, I guess an upset win here. Let, let's not uh, let's not argue with that. They, this would be an upset. But um, how do you see that style of game being played? Uh, I mean, I think for them, I, I do think that, I mean, because the way I think about it is like this. Very few people expected them to win the first three games. And then after they did that, very few people expected them to lose the next two games. So we've already seen how wild and unpredictable the NFL is. Um, and with the Eagles playing at home, um, I, I think it's, they certainly have a shot at winning this game, even though the Vikings appear to be at least the best team in the NFC, if not the NFL. But the way they could do it is really going to come down to the Eagles' defensive line dominating and taking over which could happen. I mean, I think you could see a game where maybe it's, you know, 16 to 13 or, or 17 to 13, you know, some a low scoring affair where the Eagles defensive line just does not allow the Vikings to do really anything on offense. Um, they disrupt the run game. They don't give Sam Bradford enough time to deliver his crisp passes. Um, and then maybe even force a turnover. Uh, you know, I mean, just last week, I think it's kind of crazy that even against Washington, they had a defensive touchdown and a special team touchdown, and they lost. But I think yeah. if they can get either of those again, obviously that would go a long way in helping them against a team that you wouldn't you wouldn't think that the Vikings are going to put up a ton of points on this Eagles defense. All right, uh, that game Sunday right here on 97.3. The pregame cover starts at noon. Josh Paulnil, Birds 24/7 at PhillyMag.com. The Eagles Vikings, all the material that you need right there. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me, guys.